Welcome to day three of the 12 Rants of Christmas here on the Page 180 podcast feed with myself, Jerry Leggett. I hope you're enjoying your nice Christmas break. I hope that the rants are providing a nice, uh, entertaining kind of uh, accoutrement to your Christmas spare time and uh, not just getting you wound up as well. Uh, Think about your stories. Uh, guys, today I want to talk about Twitter, which I'm going to call it Twitter. It's not X. X is a stupid name. Um, because obviously we had... Uh, you know, threads recently launched over here and I feel that it's relevant because I know we've said goodbye to Twitter many times before over the past while, but it starts to feel like with threads coming in as that starts to get more popular, you know, it will be something that we will start to phase out because I feel like Elon Musk totally misunderstands the phrase, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade because mere months after purchasing one of the world's most popular social media platforms and Twitter, Musk has turned it into what I feel is representative of any social occasion he's tried to take over and make into something that was really cool, uh, really insufferable almost immediately. He's essentially purchased lemons and somehow made it into sewage. The first man I've ever seen who turned chicken salad into chicken shit. The European launch of Threads may prove to be the nail in the coffin for what the Tesla founder has renamed X. Uh, Musk recently explained the name change, saying that calling something with 280 characters a tweet made no sense anymore, which I guess the logic follows if you're going to make no sense, why not call it an X or post and annoy the entire planet in the process? Seriously, it is almost impressive levels of incompetence for Musk to make Mark Zuckerberg into the good guy. This is the same Mark Zuckerberg who had an Oscar-nominated movie made about what a snake he was, and that was on his journey to becoming a global CEO. That, if you think about it, is insane, because we see so many of these inventors, tech bro, kind of rise and fall stories made into movies these days. Half the movies out there seem to be these type of movies. And the textbook story, origin story, usually begins with a nice nerdy guy having a great vision that the world just couldn't see that in the end changed the way we live forever. Zuckerberg started off at incel level by creating a website for him and his fellow virgin friends to rape women they were afraid to talk to that fell arse backwards into changing the planet and only became more of a dickhead from there. He's a man who has so few redeemable qualities that he just bypassed the visionary nice guy stage entirely and then his ingenious invention in just a few years went from being the place where everything happened to the place you actively avoid because it was where you learned that your distant elderly relatives were a little bit racist. Now he's perhaps more popular than ever and it's not like he's done anything particularly good. He's just not Elon Musk. And do you realize how bad you have to be at being a billionaire CEO that you give free positive P or a lick of paints to every other billionaire CEO around the planet? And yet here we are. And if threads can be just can just prove to be basically functional, which again comes with being better at being chronologically rather than just get rid of the for you tab, stop recommending us, just let us follow who we want to follow, uh, and so that we can all tweet about sports and the toy show and follow along in real time. And that's literally it, and you're there. It seems as if we're all about ready to say au revoir to the global town hall and instead move into pretty much an identical town hall next door, but just not invite Elon to the party with it finally looking like there's a pathway away from Twitter, I've actually got nostalgic for some of the good times I've shared on the app. And do you know what? I actually couldn't think of many, uh, which is fucking depressing when you consider the amount of time I've spent on it over the years. It's like realizing that I've gone to the same holiday destination every year for all of my life and then just bitched about the amenities every time I got there. But I do have three stories to come to mind for generally wild experiences on there. So let's call them my Twitter greatest hits. Number one, nearly getting sued for accidentally outing radio DJs as sex pests. For legal reasons, I'm obviously not going to mention names uh, in this uh, podcast, but one day, a particular uh, Irish radio shock jock, aka an absolute fucking melt, decided to piss off every single wrestling fan on the, in the nation for no reason whatsoever. Maybe they woke up that morning and it was the first time they couldn't see their tiny pe- penis peeking out over their beer belly. Maybe their wife accidentally called him John Cena while closing her eyes, tolerating sex with them and pretending she couldn't see him. Who knows? But they decided to choose violence that day when they opted to spend their afternoon on Twitter having a go at adults who like wrestling. 
In other words, they said, hey, people who like something I don't and will never intersect or bother me for any reason, fuck you. And being a person who at that time ran a successful events and media company largely aimed at adult wrestling fans, how I found this tweet was via the friends and customers of mine. This totally unprovoked, preventable attack was upsetting. Plus, I also realized this person was someone that I'd had a run in beforehand in my old day job and could easily take the wind out of his sails. You see, I actually spent a few years of my life working as a security guard in a well-known adult store. And I'll share those stories some other time. Don't worry, I have plenty. But one particular time, the, and I use this term loosely, personality and their fellow shock jock co-host were doing a social media blitz around Dublin, promoting a new show of theirs that was starting by taking zany pics and acting, acting like total madzers with well-known landmarks and stuff like that. I knew this because I got into podcasting after dipping my toe into radio and became a bit of a radio anorak myself, but enjoyed the freedom and autonomy of podcasting more, but I'd seen what they had been doing. So when they bundled into this adult store, giggling like 12 year old young fellas finding the condom aisle at the local Tesco for the first time and started making to get the phone out to take funny pics, I got the context of what was happening. But it was also a big no-no because the main purpose of this particular establishment was women buying lingerie and often just regular underwear which they need to wear on a day-to-day -day basis. Because of the adult nature of the store, they may feel a little self-conscious in doing so though, so a good 90% of my job was either just keeping creepy old men away from making inappropriate comments to the staff, or just making sure the place was a safe, discreet space that allowed these women to shop with dignity. And two weirdo radio DJs behaving like kids trying to get mad pics with regular customers potentially in the background is the total opposite of that. The way you deal with this is simple. You just kind of walk up and you have to treat them like children and just shame them. So you just walk up and you're like, guys, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And you just ask them questions that makes them have to justify what they're doing and realize how pathetic they sound in doing so. So eventually they left and they went outside and tried to do their mad picture at the door instead. And obviously I couldn't stop them doing that in a public space, but also the default response to whenever people did this, and they did it quite a lot, uh, was that they couldn't stop me standing in the background of their selfie, looking at them like they were fucking idiots, which cock blocked whatever they were aiming for with the picture and led to them fucking off. And I'd actually forgotten about that moment until I saw his tweets upsetting my friend. So I decided to fire off a quick quote tweet in response saying to the effect of, uh, hey, remember I kicked you out and your co-host out of a sex shop? It was a two second split second reaction designed to give the friends I saw being upset a quick laugh and disincentivize these absolute fools from punching down at wrestling fans in the future. However, within a couple of hours, it had kind of gone everywhere. We're talking thousands and thousands of likes and retweets. And of course, I don't blame him here. Your man hit the fucking roof, which was, to be fair, very funny. The absolute entitlement though, like, hey, the purpose of this exercise was for my words to upset others, not for me to be upset. It's like a bully trying to take a mental health day because the person they were trying to pick on hit them back. The most tragic aspect was that the first instinct he had was to tag his solicitor complaining who, for what it's worth, was a woman who probably dealt with tons of lads like this, so got the context immediately. Uh, so you know privately she looked at it and immediately probably had a little giggle to herself. She'll never admit it, but we all know she did. But she had a job to do, so ran through the motions of sending me threatening public tweets quoting defamation laws, which I'm no legal expert, but I don't think that's how the justice system works. I don't think I got a subpoena that day. His next move was to start blowing my DMs the fuck up with angry essays. And to tell the truth, at this stage, I did actually feel a bit bad because then he told me his wife had seen it and was flipping out with questions. And I instantly got Im an image of kids having to spend their weekends with their dad and with him being their dad on these weekends, that would likely involve them, him being totally bitter about the divorce and just talking at them every single thought that ran into his head. And I didn't want to put kids through that. So I was just like, you know what? Look, this is true. I'm obviously not going to give you my employer's name or the shop in question because that gets them involved when they don't want to be. But if you want to pursue it, every action like this that we have to take has to see us write up an incident report that goes on file that has a name section in it. And because I know who you are, I would have put your name down on that. So there is a paper trail of this that backs up the story. But 
I did write this to give my mates a laugh and I wrote it in the way where people, and, and to be fair, I did write it in the way where people's imagination could run wild and they could think of it whatever they wanted. I didn't write it for the entire country to laugh at it and for his poor wife to have to suffer and deal with questions. So I said I'd meet in the middle and take the tweet down, which I did. So that was that. Well, it wasn't. He continued to hell my DMs like I was a girl he went on two dates with who ghosted him and he felt there was a real connection there. So I ended up just blocking him in the end. But there you have it. The most viral tweet I'll ever have. And I didn't even get to plug my SoundCloud. What an absolute fucking waste. Memory number two is making Chavo Guerrero trend on Twitter for no particular reason. Remember early into the COVID lockdown before we all got cabin fever and started blowing up the world when we were nice and we tried to support each other at home by doing communal things like watch-alongs of beloved movies. That was really nice and all, but they totally robbed that fucking idea from me. In my old company, Low Blows, as far back as 2015, I believe, we got the idea to pick old classic wrestling pay-per-views and re-watch them in sync with our listeners and tweet along as if they were happening live. And I really miss those days. It became a full-on all-day event with, during the day, me hyping it up by tweeting out nostalgic things like what the number one song and movies were at the time or what sports events were happening at the time. So by the time you arrived to watch the Royal Rumble 1998 or whatever it was, you felt back in that 1998 mind said listeners even began running their own bits within it so to shout out to Owen Davis who ran a morbid but also sneakily fun uh, death pool where people would guess how many people on the show had subsequently died since the first time we ran it was as these things always are the most popular night uh, and it ended up hitting on such a level that we made a trend on Twitter now part of that is just because it was the timing and it was just the right level where it was a summer evening on a Sunday when everyone was at home looking for something to do and there was no major sports or TV shows on to take people's attention uh, and tweeting about the 2004 Royal Rumble which turned out to be a weird sweet spot for many of our fans nostalgia the best part was that there were so many of us who joined in we ended up being able to kind of mobilize throughout it to confuse the ever-loving fuck out of so many celebrities at the same time and our listeners ruled because whenever we ran a bit like this no matter how random or niche it was they went with it to the letter so in this case when we're tweeting about the entire thing not just saying oh remember how cool this was we were tweeting about it as if it was happening live now and then tagging wrestlers as they appeared and everyone playing along which said to wrestlers then <laughs> who had been on the show probably getting terrified as they get a flurry of tweets responding to what they were doing in the present tense but actually from a match they'd probably forgotten they even had in 2004 Four. This reached the zenith when uh, one Chavo Guerrero. Uh, at the time, we whenever we discussed a new pay per view on the show that happened, we'd rate it on what we called the Chavo Guerrero scale, which would be absolute bollocks taking the piss out of rating scales. When my co host Don would rate a show, stuff like Four Mankinds having a point with nine Triple H's or whatever. So when the Chavo appeared, we all lost it to the point that someone realized that he had actually started to trend on Twitter, which you can probably, like I said, put it down to being a really slow news night as much as our enthusiasm. Every time I think back to that and laugh, the one thing that gets me is that sickening feeling you get whenever you get a load of notifications on social media, your phone starts to blow up and you're not like, amazing, I'm famous. You go, what the fuck do I need to deal with now? And I often wonder if Chavo thought back to his deepest, darkest secret at that time when he got those notifications like, well, Chavito, here it is. They finally got you. <laughs> and, that's, and just exactly what that secret was as well. That's what gets me curious. But also how, when he checked and found out what was actually happening, it's not like he's like, oh, that's what's going on and it instantly made sense. <laughs> it's just like, still, exactly as confusing. That was the night we officially broke the Chavo Guerrero scale. I loved it. Lastly, another wrestling example from the Low Blows days, getting uh, to test drive being cancelled for literally doing nothing. In recent years, pre-Elon Musk, Twitter became renowned for being the place celebrities' careers sometimes went to die when much like I'd experienced with the radio DJs, we realized that we had the capacity to quickly spread stories of normal people telling of famous people for how they behaved when they weren't putting on their Disney faces. 
and with the absolute worst of them that could quickly have a knock-on effect uh, on their capital as a whole and in some cases even ends their careers and there are strong arguments for and against cancel culture on both sides in the four camp we live in a world where particular sex crimes are so difficult to uh, prosecute that a quick google search can bring up almost undeniable footage or audio of famous sports people committing these crimes and yet they're still out there at the weekend making millions without any punishment so without a legal process in place to adequately deal with this it seems kind of fair that the victims do have an outlet for being able to share their stories in a way that causes justifiable and karmic reputational damage to the perpetrators where the courts simply can't on the flip side of that this can also be abused as a way to settle scores it lacks the assumption of innocence and due process that people are entitled to in order for them to provide meaningful context that could be critical in deciding if someone actually did or didn't do anything wrong also what are the rules like are we saying that it's okay to support and spread something that could damage someone's life meaningfully if they've committed a crime or if they just had what we consider to be a bad take or do something a bit embarrassing or cringy what is the kind of where, where's the line and we don't really have have that and we kind of just go about it anyway. Unfortunately for anti-cancel culture folk, their biggest and loudest advocates are generally dodgy seeming anonymous online creeps who appear to reside in the comment sections of websites waiting to strike whenever someone brings up very specific topics in a way that immediately makes you think, what did you do that you're so ashamed of, Stevie659244? And then the substance of their arguments almost always at its essence boils down to them saying, but why can't I sexually assault someone? What's wrong with it? It builds character. I actually got the experience not sexually assault or having been punished for it but i got to experience what that harsh spotlight of a cancellation attempt felt like uh, myself in the not too distant past in a past life as many of you know i was a pro wrestler and i was also regularly a pro wrestling referee and actually as a ref i had something that i severely lacked when it came to being a wrestler myself and that was talent I was quite a good referee and I to the point that I actually thought about packing the wrestling side of it in and was one stage discussing with a reasonably side company exploring uh, the possibility of coming to work for them which got looked at but then got nixed because they're not paying for a visa for a poxy rep so there went that dream. And one of the secrets to being a good wrestling referee is knowing your place. There are times on the show where you'll be called on to be a performer and the center of attention. So you have to enjoy and be able to do that. But the vast majority of the time you're out there, you have to kind of be a wallflower and bend into the background, at least as the audience is concerned. You have to help the performers in a subtle way by checking on their health and well-being throughout. You have to pass messages between performers and you have to help tell the story of the match by being essentially the rule book personified. On the Low Blows podcast at the time, one person who caught my eye regularly for not following these laws was AW referee Bryce Remsburg. Again, you have to want to be a performer, but also resist the urge to stand out, which is a tough balance to get right. And for me, I think he's actually improved in recent years for what it's worth. But at the time, Bryce regularly got this balance wrong by constantly doing things which made him the center of attention. It's kind of small, but it's that kind of small, but insightful analysis that I thought we really brought with low blows. Like you had me, who was a former wrestler turned ref, who had dabbled in promoting and booking shows too. You had Katie Harvey, who had a much more successful in-ring career than me, so often knew a lot of the famous wrestlers we discussed, or from a role running a wrestling training school. And even like when she didn't have specific context on that, she could generally spot things that random journalists who never trained could. And then you had Keane who gave really entertaining fans views of everything, but also had experience himself as being a commentator. So we could kind of look at things from all angles. That week in question on the show, I'd had a rant about Bryce on the previous show. So my crime was that while he was refing a match between Brian Danielson and Minoru Suzuki, I picked out a clip where he ran over to put himself really in the center of the camera view and started selling punches from the wrestlers themselves taking away from what they're doing and how they're punching each other i didn't really offer any context or explainer to it or hashtag it so it was more an fyi for those who listened and heard the show with context uh, rather than uh, trying to get new eyes on it and that was literally it okay i tell a lie actually no sorry my crime was that i said something that could be perceived about a negative as a at a about aew while they were at their peak essentially to be like saying i didn't like a taylor swift song you're allowed to think that but saying it out loud in a public space right now and you'll face the wrath of the swifties and it was brutal it was absolutely insane 
it got picked up by a few high follower counts things and then eventually wrestlers started picking up co-workers of Bryce started picking it up they started putting it everywhere basically it felt like the entire internet just took turns to absolutely kick me up the arse constantly and when something becomes trending what you notice on social media is that people tend to then have to go one more to try and get attention for their version of kicking you up the arse so they've got more and more extreme as it went on to the point that one person quote tweeted my tweet and they were anonymous i didn't know who they were actually but they just said die and i quote tweeted this i'm like holy shit i'm now getting death threats this is insane um but yeah that, that they swiftly deleted their tweet afterwards it was wild to the point that I was out on a date the following night this is 24 hours later and I'm on a date and I had to tell the girl that I was on a date with because I was she, I was checking my phone regularly because I'm like what is the internet saying about me now uh, for this tiny little transgression um and I was like oh I'm getting cancelled and I showed her the notifications in my phone and I had to like I had to literally like scroll down for 30 seconds to get to the end of the notifications it was that bad then I put my phone down and five minutes later I picked it up again and new notifications were coming in that i had to scroll for ages for again it was insane and it didn't stop for like three four days and people just kept making it bigger and bigger and bigger now look i'm a big boy i've done this for a long while as well like being kind of in the public eye or whatever i've never got the fucking money or never got the fucking follower account for it but i have put myself out there and i have dealt with kind of stuff like this before so i was mentally well equipped to be able to kind of just laugh it off i made a bit about it and our listeners started coming in and being like this is gas and i kind of joined in with that so i had my little corner where we just thought all of it was really funny and who cared about the rest they can say what they want they'd forget about it and they did a few days later it was forgotten about but what made it what made it worse was that a week later this exact same ref fucked up the finish to a match by getting too involved and doing exactly what they said and then everyone the instinct response was do you think that guy from last week was right and i'm like fucking yeah i'm right i'm a fucking referee i know exactly what he was doing how it was wrong you fucking assholes so the internet isn't right all of the time but you know what if you can take it sometimes it is pretty funny I enjoyed Twitter for what it was. I've got a lot of laughs out of there. I don't necessarily want it to end. Like, I, I, I and if Tread stakes off and can be just as fun as it was and we get those kind of moments and laughs and the experiences like the Eurovision, the toy show, all those shared experiences, I think it can be great. I really enjoyed tweeting along with Big Brother recently, for example. But it can have its downsides too. So again, just take that in mind too. You get the good with the bad, the rough with the smooth. So ladies and gentlemen, Having said all of that, I will say thanks for the memories, Twitter, if this is eventually the beginning of the end. Um, but yeah, like, Elon Musk, you can just fuck off. Uh, and yeah, Treads, follow me, by the way, at Jerlega. There you go. This has all been a sneaky plug for you to follow me on social media. That's what I do, guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, enjoy your Christmas. Back tomorrow with more.